Are you on the RCR mailing list? Never miss a beat of the news and hard-hitting stories you've come to know and love. Stay in the loop. Visit realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Fletcher Tabato is a former teacher and lecturer who turned his mind to politics with New Zealand First, serving two terms before exiting Parliament in 2020. He's now turned to the dark side and works as a lobbyist. Let's see if we can get an understanding about the dark arts of lobbying. He joins me now. Fletcher Tabato, welcome to The Crunch. Thanks, Matt. Good to be here. Now, you were a teacher, an economics lecturer, a former MP, and now you've turned to the dark side. You're a lobbyist. <laughs> I have been all those things, and yes, I am that. <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot of the listeners uh, uh, get their views on lobbyists from the mainstream media who almost entirely malign the very work that you guys do. Yeah, like someone yeah. like someone like me who's involved in politics, you know, deeply and has been for decades, understands how lobbying works and what can be achieved with lobbying that things like, you know, petitions and signature gathering and public speeches and that can't uh, deliver. So I'd like to explore a little bit about what a lobbyist does and, yeah, and, and to pop that balloon of this perception that lobbyists are these dark, evil, money-hungry <laughs> sort of people, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's, yeah, it's a nice topic to cover. So, yeah, thanks for thanks for going there. Happy to help. Yeah, so, so tell us what a lobbyist does. Well, I suppose if you start with, because um, they've asked the Ministry of Justice to help, you know, set some standards in New Zealand's lobby industry um, over the last maybe as long as a year it's been. I, I haven't been, I've only been a lobbyist for about, to three weeks, so I don't know the history there, <laughs> but the Ministry of Justice says it's the practice of engaging in advocacy, activities to influence policies and decisions. It takes many forms from phone calls to text to a, a beer or a coffee and maybe even an online media campaign or um, probably more likely a formal office meeting, and, and that pretty much blandly <laughs> sums it up. Uh, the reality is what I have been seeing, and when you consider the new composition of government, we've got a lot of new ministers there. We've got some amazing experience, yep. but actually we've got new ministers who don't know their portfolios with um, any level of detail. Um, I'm not maligning them. It's just the way um, allocations of ministries go to these um, new cabinet ministers. And probably more significantly, you've got a whole lot of new staff. I know mm. all the parties in the House are struggling to find good people to staff their offices with senior advisors, uh, researchers, media and comms people. So I see it, quite frankly, as acting on behalf of a client to basically educate the government or the minister or his staff and actually say, look, these are the, the decisions you're thinking about. Did you know that if you do this, this, or this, then these things are going to happen? And, it, and it's literally an education campaign um, and making them aware of the implications in the real world mm. of the decisions they're making. And so it's critically important, no matter uh, who you are, in terms of engaging with government. You, you've got to make sure they actually know what the hell's going on. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that I've explained to people about lobbying. And there's a perception that ministers know everything about the departments that they're the ministers of. But as I point out to many people, ministers are often ministers of multiple departments and of disparate uh, types of uh, areas as well. So if you look at like Judith Collins, for example, the new attorney general, we know what that role entails. It's looking at all the laws that the government is looking at enacting, making sure it's consistent with the Bill of Rights mm. Act, all of that sort of thing. But on top of that, she's also got the Ministry of Defence. Uh, she's also the minister responsible for GCSB and the SIS. And those are completely different to the disciplines required for being an attorney general. 
And so you've yeah. got, got yeah. the you've got people who are in positions where they may not know things. And and you know, a good example of this is the pandemic, right? People said, Oh, if only we had had national in charge. And I said, What makes you think that they'd have done anything different? And they said, Well, yeah. you know, they believe this and they believe that. I said, Yeah, yeah. The problem is is that with the pandemic, it's outside the area of expertise, except maybe for Shane Reti. But they would ask, have asked the same advisors, and the same advisors exactly. would have been there and given the same the advice. Same yep. And that is the problem that there is with ministers and, and advisors, is that ministers who aren't that sharp rely on their advisors, and if their advisors are wonky, then their advice is wonky. It's it's not even about being sharp, Kim. It's mm. about um, you intimated before. It's about time management. Mm. So if you've got people coming into your office and uh, purporting to be the experts on behalf of an industry or you know whatever policy matters involved, and you sit down, take it in, then that's your exposure to whatever the policy issue might be. And so that's that's what you're listening to. You know when you speak about Judith Collins. Think of her space portfolio now. She must be quite excited to have that portfolio. I don't. I don't have any clients in the space sector, but you can imagine now's the time to say um, to you know if you're in that sector, God, we should get in front of Judith Collins and just tell her what we do and um, how exciting it is to be mm. able to launch one of eleven countries in the world to be able to launch uh, rockets into space. You know, from New Zealand and all the amazing. Um, secondary business that creates, never mind the uh, core business itself. You know, it's an amazing story to tell. And really and truly, that's what you want your minister to know about and their staff so that they uh, ideally uh, are as passionate as you are about what you're doing. Mm. I mean, that's if you look at Judith Collins, and you, know, you can also look at Winston Peters, for example, Malcolm Gladwell, the author, um, popularised the idea that someone needs to spend 10,000 hours at something to become an expert. Mm. They've certainly got 10,000 hours of, at governance. In terms of ministers, they're incredibly competent in, in what they're going to do. But you're right, and you highlighted there's a whole lot of new ministers who haven't had any of the sort of governance uh, exposure, not even close to 10,000 hours, uh, and, and yet they're um, responsible for very serious decision-making processes, and therefore they have to rely on those staff and uh, and advisors that they've done their 10,000 hours, and there's a good chance they haven't either. So I was talking to a um, an association yesterday, and basically all I was saying is because their experience uh, in this specific area is that the officials always push back. They might even concede points mm. and and um, acknowledge what you're saying, but then they push back and nothing seems to happen. And that's that's the policy wonks within the ministries. Um, so so the conversation was very much about well, get good data, get good information, mm. uh, package it up so it's um, simple but impactful, so that <laughs> we can potentially get in front of a minister so that they actually understand what it is their staff and advisors are coming to tell them and hopefully um, be able to push back, have a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of um, understanding of those deeper issues to go, no, 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 hold on, hold on, that's not my understanding. Now, if you're a new minister with um, even one portfolio but more than one, uh, your inclination is going to be all about time management because I don't think people out there understand no, just how huge. crazy a politician's day is. You know, I started at eight um, every morning and I wouldn't finish. Um, well, I, do people know that the bells don't ring till 10 o'clock? Um, mm. And that's actually when you're allowed to leave the premises. So you're pretty much trapped in uh, Parliament from eight when you start till 10 o'clock at night. And, you know, 10 o'clock wasn't necessarily the home time. And I was an undersecretary, not a not a full minister, and, mm. and my workload was continuous and huge. So it's going to be a, a lot about time management. So you have to be very, very conscious of that as well. Um, you can't overload these people, and you have to be supportive and try and work with their team just as much as themselves. 
Yeah, what you're saying about the policy wonks within the departments, that's certainly the case in, in areas that I'm you know, passionate about. I, I collect firearms and I'm, I'm a shooter and a hunter and all of those sorts of things. And so watching the government make laws around firearms without actually knowing raw data and then watching them rely upon the police to give them information mm. that 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 is demonstrably false the basic premise for example of behind the gun register is that there's a whole bunch of people out there that are doing what the police call um straw buying their legitimate firearms owners they're going and buying guns and then they're on selling them to criminals a whole lot of people. Geez, I'd be surprised but, if there was more than a handful. Well, that's the thing, right? So so the police tell the politicians, this is dreadful. This is how gangs are getting guns. Uh, this is uh, what we need to do to stop it. And the solution is a gun register. Of course, it won't stop it, stop criminals getting guns. But no. the, the basic premise of it is the police can only provide two examples of this happening, and there were such egregious examples that they got caught without having a gun register, kind oh, of destroying okay. the whole yeah, yeah, premise yeah. of the argument of the police that we need to have a gun register to catch these guys because, well, we caught these guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. The reality no, is, um, is it's very hard to do that, but the police as experts, you know, that advise the minister and advise cabinet, mislead the uh, politicians who are making the decisions, but it's the politicians who have to wear the anathema from the shooting community when they pass silly laws that are never going to do what they were intended to do because they were given wrong information to start. Yeah, no, that, that that's exactly where it is. And, and, and sometimes it's with the best will in the world, but just as equally the amount of stories I've heard recently of policy people who just have a personal bent. And, and they control information flow into the minister's office, and then they control the flow back from minister's instruction from that office into the ministry. You know, and there's a million different ways you can interpret uh, different instructions. And so mm. uh, it, it can be a dangerous situation. I don't think anyone, uh, um, anyone's been particularly malicious, but if it doesn't suit a particular personality, I know, um, of cases where it's been interpreted to, to suit their, you know, their own actual agenda rather than the government's, yeah. which we'll probably yeah. see quite a lot of um, over the next year or so. As um, well, we're already seeing it, aren't we? Because lobbyists aren't people just people like you who do it for a job. They could be vested interests in you know any different sector. Say in a, in a classic example of what we're seeing of some lobbying going on now directly um, using the media as a conduit is all of this opposition to the new government's policy to wind back the the silly low nicotine tobacco and, and all of the restrictions that they were going to do to remove sh um, stores selling illegal product. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. pushback that's coming from that are people like Boyd Swinburne, who I've you know interacted with before. They've got this thing called the Health Alliance, they issue press releases that get, you know, basically word for word verbatim turned into news articles, and they, they create this perception that the public is outraged at these law changes when the reality is, is most people don't care. No, I, I get the impression myself that most people don't care. Most people realise it's just that uh, rolling timetable and everything else is pretty much staying the same. So, yeah, it's just crazy, really. Now your your firm that you 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 work for has got some an interesting cast of characters. Yes, some awesome people in here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's people that I've had gone head to head with and and um, and dust ups. Um, that's part of the the game of politics. Yeah, um, but um, it takes all types. But the, the person that interests me the most in your firm is Mike Munro because he used to be an advisor to Helen Clark. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, he, when he left, and this is my observation, I don't know if it's right or not, and maybe you can go and have a chat with him and say, this is Cam's impression. Okay. But when, when he left um, working for Helen Clark, the wheels fell off her direction, and it was the beginning of the end of her because my impression and what I've heard from about Mike Munro is that 
he was quite willing to push back against Helen Clark if she had a silly idea or um, something wasn't practical. And that that struck me as a person with integrity that was prepared to, to not just say, yes, minister, you know, like the, movie, the TV program. <laughs> In your experience, is that is that a rare commodity that there'll be somebody who does push back inside the office um, with the minister? And and do you then, now that you're on the outside, do you try and find who those people are because they can be good advocates for what you're you're trying to achieve? Um, that's a really good question. So my personal experience was that I created a high level of trust in my office. And so the team knew that if they thought I was being a dick or I was personally heading down the wrong path, they could absolutely push back. But you can imagine some ministers with uh, massive egos being quite fragile about that and quite um, (laughs) not wanting to um, have that kind of uh, pushback in their own space. So I bet you it's a personal thing. And, yeah, I think you're bang on. Like, I've only been doing this like three weeks and and actually all parties are struggling to find staff, as I said. Mm. So um, I, I think it's going to be a long-term kind of get to know the people in Parliament, get to know the officers and, and, and the ministers and, you know, understand who's actually willing to listen because what most people seem to think is a lobbyist can go in and just tell a minister what to do. It just doesn't work it doesn't, like it doesn't, that. No, it doesn't work like that. So you've, you've got to build relationships and you've got to get to know people and understand uh, where they're coming from. And and sometimes you just have to simply tell a client, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> you know, you're, you're pushing the proverbial uphill. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I have been known to do some lobbying in the past. Most often, it's a it's a love job that I don't charge for it. But sometimes people come to me and say, "Look, Cam, can, can you get this in front of a minister, or can you get this in front of an MP, and can you make this happen?" And I and you're right, you have to sometimes sit back and say, "Well, I'd love to take your money and tell you that I'm going to do all of this." Yeah, but, yeah. But this is reality, and that's not going to fly. And sometimes they just like can't believe that this is the case. Yeah. Like, hang on, <laughs> you know, you know these people. I said, yeah, yeah I know them. Yeah, but that, and but it, I don't think that's an idea that's going to fly. No. In fact, I might be friends with them, but uh, it probably gives me uh, more certainty in telling you that uh, they're going to look at me, go cross-eyed, and tell me to get out of the office. <laughs> The the one thing that and this is I was giving some advice to somebody um, over breakfast um, yesterday. They came to me and they said, "Look, I've got this problem. I'm going to write this letter. And this is what I'm going to do. Can you have a look at it for me?" So I had a look at the letter. It was very lengthy. I looked at who he was uh, intending to send it to, and I said, "Well, this is all nice, this letter, but it doesn't give any solutions." And they said. Well, mm. What do you mean? I said, well, these guys are ministers. If you don't give them a solution or a range of solutions, an option A and option B and option C with all of the things like you just said earlier, um, this is what could happen if you do this and this is what will happen if you do that. And those, if you don't present those as options and make it easy for them to choose one of those options, which you'll be happy with any of those, then they're going to take that letter. They'll probably file it. Maybe they'll ask a couple of people in the office who are advisors to say, what do you think we should do on this? Mm. And if those advisors are exercised in that area, they may think up something to do or not to do. But invariably, the status quo prevails, which is do nothing. Yeah, at least... At and least so if you've you're... got to produce solution. My advice yeah. to people always, when you're going and talking to a minister, present them with a problem and then present them with a range of solutions so that they can choose one. And if you don't do that, then you're just going to have lots of meetings that go nowhere. Yeah, so you're being on the money. And the only thing I would add to that is if you've got a variety of solutions, at the very least, uh, in my own experience, I would send the team away, say, go down to our um, ministry advisors and tell them to give me some responses to these 
three or four scenarios that have been mm. provided yeah. here so that I can understand and and actually start making some informed decisions and maybe then you pick one and start following that path. So, mm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you, you're absolutely right. I remember filing a multitude of um, just letters complaining. Mind you, they weren't normally to me as a minister. They were normally to me as the deputy leader. And so they weren't in my particular purview to be able to do anything about except um, have a uh, discussion with some of the team. And then they get get filed away. So, yeah, provide provide scenarios, provide answers. Yeah. 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 One of your roles, um, well, according to Wikipedia, I mean, I'm not sure it's true because <laughs> it's on Wikipedia, but one of, you, one of your roles in the last year has been training candidates for New Zealand First to get them ready for A, being an MP, and B, the possibility of ministers, are you pretty pleased with the result that New Zealand First achieved um, at the election? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm personally stoked. Um, I still have a passion for New Zealand First and its people, and we've got some new people on the team there, and we've got some cabinet ministers. We've got ministers outside of cabinet, and we've got some under secretaries. So there's there's a raft of responsibilities uh, being handed mm. out. There, which is you know, it's it's incredible, really. So yes, I was changed uh, part of the uh, team that was training not only our candidates, but when they got into Wellington, I came down and ran some sessions uh, with the new MPs as well. So yeah, that that was that was a lot of fun. Of the the new MPs, um, you know, obviously we've got Winston and Shane. Um, sitting in there with vast experience of governance um, and and how Parliament operates. There's a whole bunch of new people. Obviously, Jenny Marcroft's back again, who's got a little bit of experience. Mark Patterson's back again. Mark Patterson's back. Uh, Casey yeah. Costello would have to be the standout, though, wouldn't she? Of, I uh, think so. I, I think there's been a lot of a lot of um, the wrong. It's the wrong word is hype, but there's been a lot of um, talk uh, around Casey. Um, now, obviously, I've uh, worked with her now and seen her operate. Um, I think people can tell that she's she's a deep thinker. She's quite considerate. And, and then when she does speak, she's actually very articulate and considered in what she says. So, yeah, I personally um, am stoked that she's been allocated um, some ministerial and associate ministerial roles. So I, I, I think we'll see some great outcomes there, particularly in seniors, for example. Yeah, I mean, I've interviewed her twice uh, on The Crunch. Um, both times uh, she impressed me immensely um, with the depth of knowledge and just the core common sense that exists within her. And, you know, you see that coming out in comments that, you know, from Shane Jones, for example, on Tuesday yes. when, you know, um, Casey's making those same things. There's a lot of comment around at the moment from Maori or purporting to speak for all Maori, representing all Maori, even though they're going to got three percent of the um, you know half of what New Zealand first got and less than half of what ACT got. There's accusations that the new government is racist. Yeah. And yet 35% of of the cabinet are Maori. It's the highest ever level of Maori it is. as it is. cabinet ministers in yeah. the cabinet and it's almost not mentioned at all uh, no. because there seems to be a perception that these are the wrong sort of Maori. No, I, I think I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. So I get, I get I'm, I'm a proud Maori from Te Arua, you know, mm. and I, I love my whanau and I'm proud of my whakapapa on that side of the family as much as I am of, of that Tabuto name, the French ancestry mm. there. But when when people stand up either um, uh, in public or, you know, at meetings or stuff and start saying they're speaking on behalf of all Māori, it literally just makes me angry in my gut. It's going to, no, you don't. It's and, and fundamentally, I think we're being let down by the politicians and... Uh, the media in particular, 
I think it's great to see Shane Jones, uh, Casey and Winston uh, able and comfortable to push back. But it's kind of you, the Māori Party have got away for too long as saying they represent Māori. They don't. They seem to be creating a victimhood um, and then uh, getting a, lot, a few people along for the ride. And it's just so upsetting and distressing to watch. I mean, it, it's frustrating uh, to see it and to see the media hurl these labels out there. Uh, you know, the Maori Party presented their protest on Tuesday with a couple of crossed guns in, yeah. in, in some images. Now, if that had been New Zealand First doing that, there would have been an outrage. If it had been ACT had done that with crossed guns, yeah. you know, if there would have been an outrage. If they had had the minister who's now responsible for all the firearms things, who was out there, you know, parading around with a firearm, there would be all sorts of outrage. But the Maori Party seems to be able to get away with overt intimidation and threats, either through their language or through their imagery. Yeah, to, to be honest, um, I, I kind of picked it um, during near the start of the election campaign that this was going to be a different Māori than um, Peter Sharples and... Uh, Taria, even, Taria, yeah. Yeah, and even um, Jimmy Flavel, you know, Te Urudua Flavel. Mm. You know, th- the there was a... Yeah, there was a class and a, um, a mana a mana about them. Mm. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately it seems uh, Shane used a beautiful word yesterday about uh, theatrics and, um, yeah. And, and, and that's, that's where the Māori party see, see their chance, which is yeah really upsetting because, uh, you know, I'm not a politician anymore and I'm starting to speak politically, but, uh, uh, you know, Māori want, you know, good housing, good education. Well, the same good, thing as everybody else wants, right? Exactly, yeah. And, and, and that, that's the message that Shane Jones says almost every time he's interviewed. Maori want the same thing as everybody else. You know, why can't yeah, we yeah. all just get along? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're in this together. People need to realise that. There's more in, holding us in common than there is uh, tearing us apart. And those who choose to tear us apart are kind of missing the point, man. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, I was reading a, a, an article on stuff, uh, you know, forgive me um, for my sins, but I was reading an article on stuff. And I got to the end of the article, and it's it's stated that the journalist was of this Nati Perot descent and this sort of descent and that sort of, I'm sitting there thinking, what on earth is this? You know, where is the little ride? Like, imagine if I was writing for stuff, what would I put? That um, you know, I'm of Scottish descent, but born in Fiji, and put, they wouldn't even consider putting that there. But because the author is, or the journalist is a Maori, they put all of their mm. whakapapa in there. And and I'm thinking, what is the point of this? We just want the news. We just want. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to know about you. You're you're just the conduit for that. But here we've yeah. got all of this stuff. Yeah, there's and, and a time and a. Time and a place. I, I love it. I'm getting old now. I'm nearly 50. And so when I meet uh, people from around the country, I do kind of start to share whakapapa and start telling stories about different families. And it, and it can be amazing because it can create a real connection. But you're right. There's a time and a place. It's kind of, no, no, you're a reporter doing a job. It's kind of, what's that mm. got to do with your your ancestry and your um, your grandmother and your grandfather kind of thing? And I think I think I'd also make the point is, uh, you know, if you actually circulate in the Maori world, which I do, and you talk to hapu leaders and iwi leaders, mm. even from within Te Arawa, they they don't agree with one another, and they don't agree with one another on fundamentals on how to best help their people, uh, economic strategies, investment strategies, um, you know, what type mm. of bloody house to build for Fano. So to describe Māori as some amorphous, unified race, to do a disservice to Māori and to do a disservice to all the individuals who are passionate about, um, you know, making a difference themselves. 
I mean, that's the thing. There's a headline on stuff on uh, on Wednesday morning. It says, you know, divisions in national over Maori policies. And they're making out that national is all over the place when it comes to Maori policies, that they're not speaking with one voice, that, that there's anxiety within national. And I'm sitting there thinking, what have we become that we aren't allowed to have discussions about things anymore? We're not allowed to have debates, whether they're robust or otherwise, yeah. because there's there seems to be, and this is where the Maori Party uh, uh, seems to be very doctrinaire in in their claims. I mean, you know, Debbie Nariwa Packer was saying that um, you know we can discount what New Zealand First says and acts says because they only got six and eight percent. Completely forgetting, of course, she represents a party that only got three percent. But yeah, I, I was listening to her math and argument uh, when she was sitting with Shane on TV, and um, yeah, I think I have to agree with you on that one. I mean, they're sitting there saying we can't have a debate on the about the treaty. This is our truth, and this is our um, slant on what we believe the treaty says, and that there shall be no debate at all. And anybody who wants to debate that is racist. And it mm. and it it is destroying our society, is creating the division, enforcing unity. Yeah. The only thing I'd say about that is all, all I've seen over the last 30, 40 years is the interpretation of the treaty itself mm. has changed and evolved. And and that's that's been driven by different individuals and as people like it or not it's they've come on board or or opposed it and so it evolves and individuals have been at the core of that evolution and so yeah you know to say this is it yeah it's it's just not right i mean i guess the maori party is doing their own form of lobbying they're lobbying the general public saying that we are right and everyone else is wrong and uh if you don't like it, well, we're going to disrupt your traffic and we're going to keep doing this until we get what we want. Well, they've seen great results from being angry, right? And so uh, <laughs> I think I think we're going to see them get angrier. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the sad part of it. And I guess yeah. that's where, you know, I think a lot of the voters of New Zealand First and Act are expecting both of those parties and their MPs to stand up and say, no, you, that's actually, you know, you, that's your view. You're entitled to your view. This is our view, and we're going to have a discussion about this. Yeah, well, let's put it this way. I've really enjoyed uh, watching Shane. You know, he did a lot of media yesterday, and, mm. uh, mate, he hit the nail on the head every time. Well, the thing is, is he's so deeply involved in it as well, you know, especially up north and dealing with, you know, he was explaining to me on in an interview about a particular development that they wanted to get off the ground, and there was something like um, 15 hapu involved in the area that it involved, and not one single one of them agreed with the other one. No, exactly. And so you got this inability to progress anything because the government of the day has said that we need to have everyone agree that this is a good idea to do this. And mm. so nothing ever happens because nobody actually sits down and and works out what are the things that we're aligned with, where are these are the exceptions, can we mitigate those, can we find a, a pathway through it. It's almost impossible. And, you know, I'm talking to another guy who's involved in the Western Bay of Plenty down your way, and he said, you know, um, the Three Waters legislation was always going to be a disaster because in his area there's something like 17 hapu that none of them agree on anything. And, and no, I was actually doing some work back immediately after leaving Parliament, trying to understand uh, Hapu's uh, interaction with the Three Waters and and their own work, and 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 that was true um, almost everywhere. Uh, to mm -hmm. find unity of voice across different geographical patches, uh, you know, in the form of Hapu was uh, almost impossible. Mm. It, it's. Until we can solve this inability to discuss things without resorting to insults and performances, I really fear for our democracy. Do you have the same sort of trepidation? Yeah, well, what I fear is um, when I would speak up against the uh, rot that was the interpretation of 
democracy as far as Māori representation was concerned and speak against that. Mm. Um, suddenly I was completely anti-Māori in all things. And yet, you know, I have the privilege of sitting on my paipai and, and one of my marae and, you know, love my aunties out there who are abusing me to get in the kitchen and, uh, you know, I love, I'm still passionate about trying to learn the rio more and, mm. you know, half my family are in kapahaka, um, being in te Arawa and I love it, you know, it, it's who mm. I am, it's, it's how I was raised. Uh, my objection to uh, the interpretation of uh, democracy and representation, unfortunately, means that for some, they have to paint me a picture as being uh, anti-Māori. And so that's what's happening more and more. You're a you're an old white man. You don't understand, even even though my circumstances might be completely different to others. Or, uh, you know, you just you, you get lumped into a into a stereotype based on one quite precise um, position you might have, and then you're categorised. And that's what's dangerous. You can't be nuanced. You can't have a discussion. You can't talk around the grey areas and um, trying to work through the detail. I mean, it we becomes saw all that. or nothing. We saw yeah. that. We saw that on Tuesday, didn't we, with Debbie Nariwa Packer insulting Shane Jones as being old and out of touch. Yeah, yeah, and he was just replying to her arguments. I mean, you know, was, she, she, she stated that you know that this government has insulted twenty percent of the population. Well, I mean, no, that, that, no. that statement can't stand. No. I mean, for a start, Maori is seventeen percent of the population, so she's you know inflated that. But she again, through you know, three percent of the vote, not even all of Maori voted for the Maori Party. Look, I think here's the, here's the stat for you. I, I don't think most people realise this. So New Zealand First, I think, are the only political party that won all the Māori seats. Yeah. But I think they did it with more than 50% of the Māori vote Yeah. back in the day. How's that for statistics? How's that for a powerful messaging? But, um, yeah, what, what we've got today doesn't even come close. Yeah, I mean, they got 3% of the total vote. Three percent out of seventeen percent. It's it. It's not a mandate. They might have won six of the seats, but it's not a mandate. No. And yet they they have a voice that's larger than they deserve. Actually, you know, it, it's astonishing. I'm just trying to look up those stats from 1996. Can't find them. I'm going to research that one, Fletcher. I really yeah, am. Yeah, yeah. Look it up. Oh. Gonna look it up because I think that's an important one, you know. That if you want if you win, yeah, that's right. New Zealand first won 17 seats sweeping every single Maori electorate, all of which have been nominated by the Labour Party. You know, that was a huge uh, accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. And the percentage was with, with which they did it as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean it's huge. Yeah, that was 13% of the electorate. Um 13.35%, you know, double what where they are now. Yeah, you know, it just frustrates me now as a commentator, as a as a radio host, to see it, who relies on communication, talking to all parties and things like that, where there seems to be this polarization that's come about in New Zealand society, at least in the last ten years, certainly in the last six, where if you're not an approved person, you can't you can't speak with that mm. person. Mm. You yeah. know, and it shuts off avenues of discussion. And if we're not discussing and if we're not debating and we're not challenging ideas, then we don't have a contest of ideas and then we've lost something. And the, the slide then is towards a homogeny of, of ideas that are approved by, I don't know, some group of yeah, well, that's street, the scary street. part. A, a, a homogeny of ideas almost sounds nice, doesn't it? Except you're going to have a head to that who's got to approve what those ideas to are, and that those ideas are, and that that is probably the most frightening thing um, when we look around world history that you could possibly contemplate. Yeah, I mean, if we look at at our history, you know, collectively, when you had this cult of personality. You know, in the Roman Empire, for example, you know, where they, the emperor was a god, 
uh, and they could do no wrong, even when they were, you know, demonstrably evil or uh, just stupid, uh, like Nero, for example. Mm. Um, there was, but you can't go against it. We've seen that with totalitarianism in the 20th century, with the rise of people like Mussolini, uh, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, you know, even Pol Pot in Cambodia, uh, the rise of communism where you have that homogeny of ideas where the leader is paramount. Nothing good comes of any of that. No, because in all of those cases, it was enforced uh, physically through violence and intimidation, you know. Mm. So, so that yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's horrible to contemplate. What we should be doing is trying to find our commonalities. I think... I think uh, the Māori Party leaders might be surprised that uh, their Pākehā uh, neighbours across the way uh, probably experience much of the same struggles as they are right now and um, that actually, uh, you know, there's more that unites us than divides us and uh, we, we've got to get back to that place and, and talk that way. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's that was actually what the result of the election was. It was a rejection of the division that had been fostered by Ardern and then Hipkins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The media seemed to keep talking about how this government's being divisive and stuff. Well, it didn't start with this government. This government is a response to where it began. So, yeah, it's yeah, it's very, mm. it's going to be, let's put it this way, it's going to be interesting for a while. Well, I mean, that brings it, I guess, back to lobbying because the, the role of a lobbyist is to uh, have conversations have an imparting of knowledge uh, where knowledge doesn't exist or hasn't existed before. And um, that's one of the key roles that I've experienced in watching and interacting with lobbyists over time, uh, looking for solutions to solve particular problems, either for a client or for a group of society or whoever you're representing. And you can only achieve that if you're actually sitting down face to face with the decision makers and being able to argue your point or um, debate a particular issue. If we cease to be able to do that, uh, and you know, this is where you know, I see these controls coming in, wanting to restrict what lobbyists can can say or do or or how they act, is actually probably going to not destroy the industry but destroy the importance of the discourse that occurs as a result of that. Well, I think some people seem to have in mind that lobbyists um, only work for big corporate giants, those with lots of money. Um, When I left Parliament, I made contact with Blind Low Vision New Zealand. I'm I'm legally blind and I um, worked with them when I was in Parliament, thought I hadn't done enough. So I went and said, how can I help? And... Mm. So I spent I spent the last three years voluntarily um, helping Blind No Vision design policy, uh, write draft legislation, try and engage with ministers, both their minister and um, ministers in the periphery, just to try and tell a story about the inadequacy of the health system's response to people who are struggling with vision. And so, you know, if people understand that Greenpeace is a lobby group or, um, you know, Blind Low Vision New Zealand's a lobby group. You know, it puts it in perspective that it's not it's not just these big giant corporates. And I'm not saying that that's wrong either. Actually, they, they're trying to um, create business, create jobs, mm. um, create massive tax revenue for the company, uh, for the country most of the time. So it's a spectrum and um, it's all about uh, creating understanding in that, in that building we call the Beehive. Yeah, or the wasp nest, as our listeners like to call it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, well, Fletcher, it's um, it's been a, a fascinating little discussion, and I think that the listeners will have a better understanding about the role of lobbyists, that they're not all um, evil Machiavellian-type people that are seeking to subjugate um, society. No. <laughs> that, that, no, that, that, that you actually care deeply about the, the topics in the... Um, clients that you're working for, um, trying to res- achieve the same results that people often say they're going to stand for Parliament for. There's exactly, many- and, and it's actually uh, I've noticed that there's 
a lot of crossovers. That as a politician who was um, an undersecretary and even in the backbench in the day, you, you're trying to be an advocate and a voice to get in front of ministers and um, make sure they understand the full picture. So, yeah, man, thanks for the chance to chat. I appreciate no, it. No problem, and I'm sure we'll chat again. And uh, the offer goes out to the other members of your team there as well that uh, if they want to have a chat with the new cam, the nice cam that uh, they probably don't recognise, then I'm all ear, I'm all ears and willing to have them on the show as well. All right, man. I'll pass the message on. All right, thank you. All right, cheers, Ken. Well, there you have it. A bit of an insight into the dark arts of political lobbying and a little bit extra talking about the overt racism or the allegations of racism of this government. Don't say ever that I've kept you in the dark about how all of these things work. It's a little bit like asking people how sausages are made. If you knew, you wouldn't eat them. But now you know how politics works. Tell me your thoughts on what Fletcher had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thanks for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. Do you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to? Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We'd love to hear from you. So connect with us today.